So in a recent video, I talked about Dan Gurney and his Eagle Mark I, Dan Gurney being part of the three so-called driver constructors of the 1960s, where they basically built their own cars with the dream of winning the World Championship in a car that had their own name on it. And I know there were a couple of other teams, there was later Graham Hill and John Surtees, they had their own teams, but the three from the 60s are sort of the, the main ones. But while Dan Gurney wasn't able to achieve his goal of winning in an American-built car, and Bruce McLaren was tragically killed testing one of his McLarens at Goodwood in 1970, there was one man who was able to win the World Championship in a car bearing his own name. And that man is Jack Brabham. Now, Brabham was born in Australia in 1926, and during World War II he joined the Royal Australian Air Force hoping to be a pilot, but instead the Air Force put his skills as a mechanic to good use. Now Jack, whose birth name was actually John, worked on Bristol Bowfighters at the Williamtown RAAF station near Newcastle in New South Wales. And after the war, he started racing midget cars, and it was through these that he got into full-on racing. Through meeting various people in Australia and New Zealand, Brabham ended up arriving in England where he bought a Cooper car to race in National Series. Because he was buying parts direct from the factory, he became friends with the owners, and over time started to build up a relationship that would ultimately lead him to his first races in Formula One. Brabham proved himself in Coopers at non-championship events, one of which being at Alton Park where he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sterling Moss, regarded as one of the best drivers in the world at that time. He would later sell his customer Cooper and use the funds raised to move his wife and eldest son Jeff to England. It was in Coopers that Jack won his first two world championships in 1959 and 1960, and Jack had been instrumental in the design of the 1960 car. But he knew that he could do better, and was able to persuade his friend Ron Turanak to move to the UK, where they sold upgrade kits for Sunbeam Rapiers and Triumph Heralds out of his car dealership. The aim, though, was to build his own racing cars. Motor racing developments were set up with this aim in mind, and soon Brabham was producing Formula Junior cars by the middle of 1961. But it was in 1962 when the Brabham Racing Organisation started racing in Formula 1, initially using customer Lotus 24s but then debuted their own car, the BT3, at the German Grand Prix. Now BT stands for Brabham Turanak, for reference. Now Jack had left Cooper at the end of 1961 and was now racing for his own team, but the 1.5 litre formula didn't work for him, and the two-time champion went winless with a best result of fourth at the US and South African Grand Prix. For 1963, the BT7 debuted at Zandvoort, and the results were still hard to come by, retirements and non-point scores being more common than finishes, particularly in 1964. A couple of wins did happen though. The team's first victory was at the non-championship Solitude Grand Prix in Germany in 1963, and more non-championship wins in 1964, with Dan Gurney taking the first World Championship wins for Brabham in 1964 at the French and Mexican Grand Prix. But during 1965, Brabham was sort of taking a step back, and Gurney was the de facto number one driver, because Brabham was considering retiring from the sport to focus entirely on running the team and making the car good. But when Gurney decided that he was going to go off and start his own team and build his own cars, it put Jack back in the driving seat. Literally, for 1966. And for 1966, the rules regarding engine capacity went up to 3 litres, doubling the engine capacity that had been in use since about 1961 or so. Given that this was still an era where teams were insistent on using the biggest, most powerful engines they could get their grubby little mitts on, Brabham tried a different approach, using fewer cylinders. Eight instead of 12, which would have resulted in a lighter car and theoretically a more reliable one too. Brabham went to the Australian engineering company Repco to build him an engine, but Repco said they didn't know if they could since they had no experience with building an engine from the ground up. So Jack handed them the block from an Oldsmobile 215 and went, try that. Now that engine block is said to have cost Brabham £11. The car was constructed with a steel space frame chassis, which at that time was pretty much ancient, as most of the other teams had followed Lotus's lead with the monocoque setup. Brabham had an easy to repair construction philosophy, and all the customer cars used the space frame design so they were using it too. They just had to prove it worked. They also put oval tubing around the cockpit to keep that area strong, and despite all this, it was one of the lightest cars on the grid, and the suspension uprights were modified from a Triumph Herald. So it was proper shed stuff. So you've got Ferrari and Maserati wanting to stick with V12 Grunt. Lotus were going through engine configurations like Watford Football Club goes through managers, there were mistakes made with the BRMH16, and the Climax V8s were obsolete. But Brabham had an engine that was reliable, and that was the main thing, even if it didn't have a lot of power. 
The Repco engine bolted into the BT-19 was exactly what Brabham needed to be competitive again, and it was in the BT-19 that Brabham won his first race since 1960. The BT-19 was also a bodge job, since the thing was initially built to house a Climax Flat 16, but thanks to the FIA changing the rules, they had to somehow shoehorn in a 3-litre V8. Much like how the Braun car of 2009 was initially built for a Honda engine, but then they had to somehow get the Mercedes engines used by McLaren rammed into that engine cover. This Repco engine was lighter than the Maserati V12 by about 70 kilograms and produced 300 horsepower, which was about 30 less than the V12s. But it had more torque than the V12s and used less fuel. Now, figures online say that it was able to run about seven miles to the gallon as opposed to the four miles to the gallon of, in Jack's own words, the more exotic rivals. But there was one small little issue they had to navigate themselves around, and that was the gearbox. It was a Hewland gearbox, which was pretty much a standard for that era. But that Hewland gearbox was only designed to take the torque of a two litre engine, not a three litre engine. So Jack had to be very careful when pulling out of the pit lane and also getting the car off the start line. The gearbox failed at the season opening Monaco Grand Prix, and at the notorious Spa race of that year, Brabham called on his midget car experience to drift his way out of a problem when the rain came down and wiped out half the field, most famously Jackie Stewart. But at Reims though, Brabham scored the first win of the season, slipstreaming Lorenzo Bandini and using that to keep up with the more powerful Ferrari and then taking the victory when Bandini's car ran into throttle trouble. Jack then won the next three races at Brands Hatch, Sandville and the Nürburgring, proving to the motorsport press that he hadn't fluked it at Reims and that he wasn't too old to win races. He then retired at the Italian and US Grand Prix. But since John Surtees needed to win all three of the last three races of the season and also retired at the Italian Grand Prix, Black Jack was world champion for the third time. The engine was more reliable than they could have imagined. It only conked out once, at Watkins Glen, when it was in the new BT20. Three world championships put Jack second on the all-time list at that point, behind Fanjo. He was also 40 when he won it, and he also became the only person to win a world championship in a car that carried his own name. Dan Gurney and Bruce McLaren would also have their own race teams in the 1960s. John Surtees and Graham Hill would start their own outfits in the 1970s, but none of them ever managed to achieve the top result. Gurney won a race, but he didn't win the World Championship. McLaren won races, but couldn't win the World Championship. A World Championship in their own car has only been done by one person. Quite an achievement, really, and a very unique one as well. So where is the Brabham name today? Well, there was some legal wrangling between the Brabham family and Franz Hilmer, who tried to enter Formula 1 in 2010 using the Brabham name. And there was another attempt at using the name by a car dealer who'd been using the Brabham name for things as well. A ruling in the High Court has now determined that in the European Union, the Brabham family owns all rights to the Brabham name. Jack's son David, who funnily enough raced for Brabham in the early 90s and also Simtech in 1994, as well as winning Le Mans in 2009, was the one who spearheaded everything and managed to get the name back under the control of the family before Jack's passing in 2014 at the age of 88. Now thinking about it, Jack and David Brabham both drove for the same team. Has that ever been done before? Father and son driving for... Rosberg. Nico and Keke Rosberg both drove for Williams, didn't they? And I guess there's Yoss and Max Verstappen as well, if you count Minardi and Toro Rosso. But you can argue about that one in the comments as you see fit. In 2021, Brabham entered the GT2 European Series with a BT63, which looks like an absolute weapon of a car. And David is looking at entering other forms of motorsport with Brabham-built cars. In addition, Brabham is now on the virtual track with Brabham Esports, which is part of the Zancho Simsport Group along with Jensen Button's Rocket. And Brabham is actually competing in the Le Mans Virtual Series alongside Rocket as well. So then a look at the only time a man has won the World Championship in Formula 1 in a car that's got his own name written on it. If this has been something new for you here today, then do like the video so the algorithm can do its thing. And if you want more stuff like this, then get subscribed, get that bell on, do whatever your kids do to, you know, consume more content. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the support and if you want to help out with buying some pretty pictures for these historic videos you can help out by clicking the link in the description but there's also links to Discord and my socials and there's also super thanks underneath the video as well if you just want to top up my coffee cup or whatever. So until next time I've been Aidan Millward, have a cracking day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.